Hello. Apologies for not being uh, amongst you. Um, so I decided to record this talk and give the presentation right here. My talk for today would be uh, on genomics to precision medicine, where I'll describe what we have been doing in, in the lab over the last few years and how we could advance the science of genomic medicine in Asia and specifically in India. Before I start my talk, let me introduce what my lab works on. I'm a computational biologist and I work in this area called genomic informatics. And in the lab, we largely work on three things. Uh, we try to understand the genomic organization, uh, to be specific, the vertebral genome organization, trying to understand the non coding RNA in biology, trying to understand how the transcripts are regulated through studying the epigenetics as well as genome regulation. The other part of my lab largely works in the interface between clinical medicine and basic biology, where we develop a number of tools and protocols to help clinicians arrive at very precise diagnosis. And this spans a variety of areas, right from understanding pathogen genomes, uh, personal genomics in clinical medicine, as well as pharmacogenomics. To introduce why we are here and why we are discussing this topic, we need to go back to history. When we started a lab in 2006-2007, it is also the most exciting times in, in genomics where as you see the cost of whole genome sequencing has been dwindling very rapidly. Thanks to the technologies which we collectively name as next generation sequencing technologies, the cost has been phenomenally reduced over the last decade which now is, makes it possible for us to do whole genomes or whole exomes in clinical time scales and at clinical random times. So when we started this activity in 2006-2007, the slide actually shows the admixture map of the entire world derived from the Human Genome Diversity Project. And as you see here, almost all the whole genomes that were done at that point of time, whether it was a reference genome, the went in the Watson genome, or the Japanese, Chinese and the Korean genomes were all from quite homogeneous populations or less admixed populations across the world. But as you see here, the most admixed populations in the world are derived from the Middle East and Central and Southeast Asia, largely due to the complex patterns of uh, cultural practices as well as migration which happened through this part of the world. While there was no whole genome from this unique regions of the world. And that's when we started working on the Indian genome. Uh, way back in 2008 and 2009, we put together a whole genome from this part of the world. Also being able to build pipelines to be able to analyze the genome in, in the perspective of clinical annotations in terms of the traits, in terms of the diseases and trying to predict what the individual could have or is susceptible to. We didn't really stop there. We went across the entire Southeast Asia trying to collaborate with a large number of clinicians and researchers to be able to understand the genetic diversity of this region. We were part of the first Sri Lankan genome, the first Malaysian genome. We also were co-founders of the Pan-Asian Population Genomics Initiative, which is a flagship project under the Human Genome Organization. We also ventured into the Middle East in the last three to four years, trying to build networks and collaborations to also create one of the most comprehensive data repositories for genetic variations in the Middle East. Now the real question comes to, if we can do whole genomes, can we really put it into clinical practice? And there comes the question of an average patient. The patient is always an average because practically all the clinical trials are done on an average patient. The treatment is done on an average patient. The clinical trials which discover the molecules that we practice today are built upon cohorts of average people. Quite contrary to what the fathers of modern medicine have originally stated, it's far more important to know what person the disease has than what disease the person has. Now, the problem of treating an average patient is once in a while you end up with complications and these complications are otherwise known as adverse drug reactions. 
an adverse effect reaction is going to be uh, quite severe in some cases, what we call a Steiner Johnson syndrome, or could be very mild in terms of very specific uh, difficulties like stomach pain and so on. The real question is can genomics prevent this disease uh, or this from occurring? And that lands up with a new speciality, what we call as genomic medicine. So, genomic medicine is a speciality which involves genomic information of an individual as far as part of his comprehensive healthcare supervision. Now, if you look at, look at the evidence on how big is this problem, probably the only study from India was in 2007, which estimated that approximately around 4% of people who present with an present to an emergency department would have an adverse drug reaction. Uh, a large number, a large proportion of these would have an adverse drug reaction of moderate severity with approximately an added cost of $150 per patient. Now the question is can we try to prevent this and to prevent this we need to understand how the system really works. And in realistic terms the system is quite simple. Most of the drugs that we take are either taken through the gastrointestinal tract or through the parental route directly into the system of circulation. And whatever you take in the gastrointestinal system is first metabolized by the liver, which is called first pass metabolism. The metabolized drug is then distributed into the system of circulation. Excretion largely happens through the kidneys and they are solubilized into water soluble molecules which are excreted in the urine. In a very small number of drugs, could be taken as inhalation and a very small number of drugs could also be excreted through breath. So essentially the drug which is in the systemic circulation is what distributes in the extracellular space and which gets actively or passively transported inside the cell which act on the cognate target. So this entire simplistic system can be in terms of genomics divided into four components. You have the drug, we have the drug metabolism and excretion as well as the drug interaction with the cognitive target as well as the off targets which cause the effects as well as the side effects. And this entire system is modulated through carrying transporters which shuttle the drug across membranes, metabolizing enzymes which metabolize the drug into soluble forms for excretion and as well as the drug targets and the off targets which are nothing but proteins through which the action of the drug or the side effect of the drug is modulated. If you go back to literature and under, try to understand this and that phenomenon, you would understand that a large number of genetic variants has been discovered over the last few years, to be exact around a decade and a half. And this entire corpus is approximately around 20,000 publications which describe genetic variants in each of these genes, whether it's a tra carrier, transporter, metabolizing enzyme, or the drug target, which could modulate the effect of each and every drug. Now, as you would imagine, and this corpus is very large and is currently growing at approximately around 2000 publications every year. Now the real question comes back to how do we put this corpus into clinical utility? For that you need to annotate them into a very systematic format and that's where we created the Open PGX Consortium involving large number of clinicians as well as researchers and students from across this region um, which includes from Malaysia, from Korea as well as from India and Sri Lanka. We put together this comprehensive open access data resource as well as tools and techniques to be able to interpret this genomic information and build evidence based guidelines. And as of today, we have approximately curated around 25,000 interactions involving drug metabolism, transport, as well as interact, interaction with the cognitive targets, and approximately around 6,000 annotations of the 20,000 corpus. Each of these annotations go through a multiple level of quality check, right from the QC team to a specialist to a subject expert. And the end result of this entire curation exercise is a complicated network, as you see here. To make things simple, the, the nodes in this network are drugs and therapeutics, which needs to reach the target. And before they reach the target, they need to be metabolized or transported across the membranes. And as you see here, it's very difficult for any single individual to make sense out of this complicated network. So you need to have computational tools to be able to interpret this and to be 
able to provide a visualization which is clinically interpretable. Unfortunately, there was a time when we were working on the, the Malaysian genome with wonderful collaborators from the UIT in Malaysia. And what we put together is a complicated pipeline, uh, a computational pipeline, which would take in the genomic information, or to be exact, the variant information, query it across a variety of databases for pharmacogenomic relevance, and also look at regulatory variants and put all of this into the perspective of an individual and the kind of drugs that he would have a problem with. The next slide actually shows uh, how this could be visualized. So in the bottom panel you have all the drugs organized by their classes. You have the transporting transporters or the transporting enzymes, the metabolizing enzymes, and the end you have the drug targets. So as you see here, this is pretty much like a roadmap from point A to point B. The drug has to reach the drug target to have its effect. The mutations in any of these components, whether it's a transporter or a metabolizing enzyme, would cause an abnormal concentration of the drug to be effective at the cognitive target site, either a very high level or a very low level, depending upon the type of the mutation. Now, as you see here, if you have a colored bar, that means that particular gene is mutated. If you have a black bar, that necessarily means that there is no root block in this entire process from point A to point B. And as you would imagine, subsets of drugs would be metabolized or transported by a particular carrier or a transporter or a metabolizing enzyme, which would mean the required concentration might not be present at the cognitive target site. So in other words, an individual or a person can build maps of himself for every possible drug for which the evidence is available and be able to now enable the clinician to select the appropriate drug for the appropriate individual. We could now extend this in a population scale if, for example, genome sequencing was not readily available. And this is what we did with the Malaysian cohort of approximately 100 individuals. We could now build maps specific for a population and now try to say what are the kinds of drugs for which a drug dosage needs to be modified at a population level or a country level to enable policies which would prevent adverse drug reactions occurring on a very large scale. To be emphasizing on two specific drugs, which has very large corpus of evidence uh, for utility in pharmacogenomics, these are warfarin and clopidogrel. And, and warfarin, for example, is taken by approximately 33 million people in the US. And it's a cause of approximately a third of all adverse drug reactions in the elderly people. It has a very large amount of variation or in the individual variation in response. And people have shown in previous publications that the heritability can be up as large as around 20% in warfarin and as large as around 83% in the case of clopidogrel. So with these with this two drugs for which the FDA recommends uh, testing uh, for dose modulation. We looked at a very large cohort of individuals in the Middle East. Uh, to do this, we first aggregated a large number of genomes and exomes from the region to able to create a comprehensive compendium of approximately around 26 million variants from around 2,000 whole genomes and exomes from the region to create this comprehensive database called Almina. And from this database, what we realized or what we learned is that uh, for warfarin, the high dose associated variant was very high prevalent in the population, approximately around 38%. And the clopidogrel resistance associated variants in the CYP2C19 were actually found at very low uh, frequencies. And uh, as you would have imagined, this differential was also observed across the subgroups. The 2C9 variants, which are associated with the low, low dose of warfarin, was mostly found in the Bedouin populations compared to the Persian and Southeast Asian uh, people in the Middle East. Um, of course, if you could not afford to do whole genomes and whole exomes, you could do it with the GWAS arrays, which were otherwise uh, used for 
study cohorts of individuals. In this particular study, in collaboration with my colleague Dr. Dwai Pan, we looked at approximately around 2,000 individuals who were part of a GWAS study for obesity and diabetes in North India. As you would see here, we will assay approximately around 10 variants which have very high clinical importance in the case of clopidogrel pharmacogenomics. Um, and the plot actually shows allele frequency of these variants for these 10 genes and variants. As you would see, the average allele frequency across the Indian population, or to be specific, the North Indian population, is quite distinct from the rest of the world. And what this allele frequency difference would mean is that we have a very good intestinal absorption, very good bioavailability or activation of the prodrug, and a very high inhibition of platelet aggregation, which would mean probably that the dosage of clopidogrel that most people in North India receive as part of the standish, standard dosage uh, based on trial done in the Caucasian population is probably inappropriate or high. So moving on to uh, uh, a separate section of genetic diseases and traits, as you would imagine, most of that we talked um, till now is variants which are quite frequent in the population. Now, these variants could largely be classified into two types, variants which have very high frequency or variants with a very large effect size. Now, effect size would mean, in other terms, the penetrance of the genetic trait. So, most of the pharmacogenomic traits would fall into modest sized variant frequencies with modest size effects. While most of the GWAS, as you would see, uh, works on the principle of taxonets, looks at complex diseases or common diseases and associated common variants. On the other end of the spectrum, we have genetic variants which have very large effect sizes and but nevertheless are extremely rare in the population and these cause extremely rare genetic traits. And the methodology to look at these extremely rare genetic traits is whole genome or whole exome sequencing. Now, the application of whole genome or whole exome sequencing is largely to understand rare genetic diseases. Rare genetic diseases have been known from very old times. Um, this is a picture or an artistic representation of a genetic disease from 80,500 and this describes the monster of Ravenna. In many cases, these monsters are nothing but extremely rare genetic diseases and this particular case a similarity to what is, what is presently known as Robert syndrome. The problem with extremely gen rare genetic diseases is that even in 2015 or 2017 as we stand today, there is not much hope in sight. There are many families which suffer from genetic diseases in this particular family. We described a family which was, which was in press very recently from a small village in Agra where a family of eight siblings, six of them were affected after around four years with progressive motor impairment as well as macrocephaly and present with seizures. So to address this problem, we ventured into creating a clinical collaboration, which today is more than 100 clinical collaborators from 35 major centers across India, forming one of the largest networks for rare genetic diseases in India and not just in India and almost all of Southeast Asia. This clinical network, which we call as Guardian, gets referrals from clinicians. We put them through a standard whole exome or whole genome sequencing and for the variants, we report them back to the clinician. Uh, we get a large number of novel variants and novel genes as part of this exercise which is taken up for modeling in, in vitro, in vivo, as well as in silico, as well as take them through a possible drug screen, which I will describe in probably the later part of this topic. So this large network today extends not just in India, but across the boundaries, with the referrals coming from East Europe, uh, from Middle East, as well as Southeast Asia. And studying rare genetic diseases, of course, is an opportunity because India is a very large and populous country. 
it gives us an advantage to identify new genes and pathways and not just discover them but now to put them back into clinical practice by enabling prenatal testing and prenatal counseling so that the diseases can be prevented from occurring in the next generations. The background of this entire program is actually an allele frequency compendium uh, which involves close to over a thousand exomes and genomes and 169 million genetic variants largely derived from Southeast Asia. To give an example of a few cases that we have solved in the past, uh, this slide describes a very large family of around 54 individuals suffering from uh, a disease called epidermolysis bullosa simplex. Um, so we sequenced a couple of individuals from this large family, identified a very novel variant in KRT5 and took them back into Sanger sequencing or genotyping to enable diagnosis for the entire family and of course to put across an assay which is availed by the family for prenatal testing and counseling. In another family, as we see here, we discovered a novel genetic variant in called 71 on the collagen 7 gene associated with a similar disorder called recessive dystopic epidermosis mullosa. In most of these cases, the, the family is uh, ostracized by the community because of the appearance of the skin. In this particular case, we discovered the novel variant. We could enable the prenatal diagnosis in the family and as you see here, a normal kid was born who was negative for the disease. And to put the family at an advantage, we, we also enrolled them for a clinical trial which is happening in Europe and the patients could avail uh, at least partial uh, cure with the clinical trial. Coming back to the original family that I described before, uh, this family had six kids out of the eight siblings who were affected with a genetic disease with the professional diagnosis of leukodystrophies made. So through polyxome sequencing, we identified a novel variant in the MLC1 gene which confirms the diagnosis of megalencephalic leukoencephalopathy with subcortical cyst type 1. Um, we could extend this uh, genetic variant across the population or subpopulation rather. This subpopulation largely comprises of a large endogamous group uh, of Muslim community called Nalband residing in Agra and in and around the region. We surveyed approximately around 82 individuals in this community and through this we discovered another three families suffering from the same genetic disorder as well as revealing a very large carrier frequency totaling to approximately around 28%. And what we put across to this entire community is the genetic assay that they can use for prenatal counseling as well as prenatal diagnosis as well as carrier screening to enable prevention of this disease from occurring in the next generation. And we have implemented this through uh, a set of platforms which are available by the clinical community. I described Guardian and how the research program works in the Guardian and the assays that are developed as part of this program are also implemented into the Enbury platform which is called as GoMed, where the focus is on affordability and accessibility to genomic medicine. At this moment we have put across approximately around 80 gene tests which is benefited by approximately 2000 patients every year. And what we plan to move forward is to actually model this variance in a model system like ZebraFish uh, with my colleague Sridhar and to enable uh, drug screening on the model system to take at them for clinical trials in the future. We have made some headway in this area by using cominformatics approaches and involving a large number of students as part of crowdsourcing initiatives. But before I conclude, let me emphasize that the real impediment for clinical application of genomics is not just the availability of technology, of course availability of technology is important, but what is more important is the lack of standardized computational tools and bioinformaticians to implement this in a clinical scale. So as part of this program, that we run in the lab, 
we have developed a very large number of clinical resources, informatic resources and databases which enable clinical diagnosis and which can enable automation of most purposes of clinical diagnosis and reporting. To give an example, uh, this is a clinical reporting engine that we developed for mitochondrial disorders. Mitochondrial disorders are very common genetic disorders with approximately an incidence of 1 in 5000 live births. Um, and we estimated that approximately 20 million mothers would benefit from upgrade genetic diagnosis in the case of mitochondrial disorders. Well, the gold standard of mitochondrial disorders was using Sanger sequencing. We converted them into an NGSHA assay which makes it more scalable and, and cost effective and an automated computational engine which could make clinical diagnosis, prenatal testing as well as carrier detection for these individuals. This is recently licensed to Eurofins and is available in India and Southeast Asia under the brand name MyDashure. Now coming back to the end point which is provided you have the genetic resources, you have the infrastructure to be enabled sequencing as well as genotyping, the computational resources to enable accurate diagnosis and reporting. Still the question remains are people ready to do whole genome sequencing and probably the only evidence to, uh, to address this point was done way back in 2010, 2010 where a large number of people who, who were queried would but still not agree to whole genome sequencing or whole genome sequencing even if it was available for free. So we redid this entire survey in an educated population in India and our findings suggest that a vast majority of approximately around 87% of individuals were ready to do the sequencing as well as share the information in public domain provided it was done for free. To summarize, what we see is uh, clinical medicine and genomics would meet a confluence and this confluence is what we largely call as P5 medicine where genomics could enable prediction, prevention, make diagnosis more precise as well as treatment more personalized and this is all possible and this would all be possible only if there is a participatory approach involving not just clinicians but the patients the caregivers as well as the patient support groups. To summarize, the, the motto in the lab has been if you don't un understand anything about a system, probably you should try doing genomics. Almost all what I have spoken about has been contributed by a very large number of students in the lab as well as wonderful collaborators not just from India but across Asia and generous funding from CSIR through multiple different grants. I'll stop here and take questions, but to state, we invite collaborations from across Asia to advance the science of genomic medicine. You could contact me in the links provided here. Thank you.